Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your Twitter feed or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Vivi Ganeshanathan, also known as Sugi, author of the forthcoming novel Brotherless Night. And I'm Whitney Terrell, author of the novel The Good Lieutenant. So Whit, how are you feeling about the election? Oh, no doubt. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I don't know. I, you know, that I listen to I get a lot of news from podcasts and I read the times and stuff like that, but the, the podcasts that I'm listening to, which are democratic, so centrist or left-leaning podcasts, uh, they're saying that things are shifting the Republicans way. The polls kind of look that way, but I'm not sure. I mean, the polls are still close and I'm not in Doomsville yet. How, why are you not in Doomsville when like all over the country, there are election deniers running for office and in Arizona, for example, we have candidates like Carrie Lake, who's running for governor and Mark Fincham, who's running for secretary of state. And those are both uh, people who deny the legitimacy of the last election, despite the fact that those results have been tested in recount after recount and proved to be totally legitimate. I'm not saying I feel good about Arizona. <laughs> Arizona is bad. So why are you not in Doomsville? Because I'm in Doomsville. Well, I need I, because, <laughs> or get because Arizona is Arizona is not every state. And, you know, that's a state race. You're talking about those are state races. And those matter because the governor and the secretary of state will be the people who are counting the votes. And that seems very dangerous to have people who don't actually believe in the process of counting votes, counting uh -huh. votes. I, I agree. That's a serious problem. Um, but I still the Democratic candidate for Senate in that state, Mark Kelly, is still pulling ahead and can win, I think. And I think if the Democrats can hold the Senate, things will basically be OK. I do think that would be something of an achievement in a midterm election, because especially during a president's first term, those traditionally tend to swing toward the party out of power. Um, but the Dems got thrashed in 2010 and Obama still came back to win the presidency again in 2012. Exactly. Um, all right. So we're not 538, but here are some numbers to think about. Um, there seem to be six key swing states, Ohio, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and Nevada. Um, according to the Washington Post, the Republicans need to win four of these to gain control of the Senate. I do think the Republicans look like they're going to win Wisconsin, but I'm not sure I see three more victories for conservatives in those other states. Okay, so we're recording on October 28th, and 538 has the Dems ahead in Arizona and Pennsylvania, but just slightly behind in Nevada, Georgia, and Ohio. What? That's so we now were, you're with me. We were ahead so, in those places. What's going on? I, so oh, you're in Doomsville like now that. with me. Let, Maybe. Oh, look, I, I cannot. You said that, that Herschel Walker is actually in the 538. Averages ahead in Georgia? I mean, I who can explain Herschel Walker? I can't believe Possibly that he's going to win that race. I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know. I don't have any answers then, I guess. Elections are confusing. Now I'm more scared. Maybe I don't want to talk about this at all. We're just going to cancel this episode. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Settle down. Settle down. I feel like we could, I know what we can do. We can talk about fictional elections instead. Like the ones where no Republicans vote. Uh, no, we're not doing an episode on utopian literature yet. Um, okay. We're doing, um, we can do elections in books where candidates are human and interesting and indelibly memorable. Um, you know, I think we've we've talked about Hillary Clinton, for example, in previous episodes, like with our friend Curtis Sittenfeld of when we talked about Rodham. But this time I'm thinking about a, a fictional character who Hillary Clinton has been compared to, Tracy Flick, the iconic character from Tom Perotta's election. And she is back in a new novel. Wait a second. Are we get, we get to have Tom Parada on the show? I would be willing to lose Nevada for that, or maybe even Arizona. We do have Tom Parada on the show, and he's here to talk to us about elections, both real and fictional. He's the best-selling author of 10 works of fiction, including Election and Little Children, both of which were made into Oscar-nominated films, and The Leftovers, which was adapted into a critically acclaimed Peabody Award-winning HBO series. His other books include Bad Haircut, The Wishbones, Joe College, The Abstinence Teacher, Nine Inches, and Mrs. Fletcher. His work has been translated into a multitude of languages. He grew up in New Jersey and lives outside of Boston. He's here to talk with us about his latest book, Tracy Flick Can't Win. Tom, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm really happy to be here. So we've invited you here to discuss the election and your new book, and you've just published your second novel about Tracy Flick. Um, this past summer, the iconic character who first appeared in election. 
and who is, I think, beloved by so many of us. And in Tracy Flick Can't Win, she's famously competitive and famously qualified and famously bad, as usual, at getting what she deserves, what she feels she deserves, which is to be the principal of the school where she works. Um, and she's an assistant principal of the all grown up version of her. And to me, this version of Tracy, just kind of like even reading that description, I'm a little bit like, that's that's like some recent iterations of the Democratic Party. And I'm curious about what you think. <laughs> well, uh... What do you mean by that? Why uh, wanting to well, be the principal? Yeah, I guess like you know the 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 party that I mean at least I mean here I'm obviously quite partisan, but you know the um the party that is doing things correctly, uh, the party that is you know believes that elections can be legitimate, that there's a process to be followed. Um, Tracy at various points in the book is sort of like, oh, there's a good process in place. You know, I did things kind of the way that I was told I should do them. Yet somehow I can't quite get across that finish line. And, you know, I kind of felt like I saw a little bit of um, the Democratic Party in recent years where I'm sort of like, why are you not winning? Why are you not getting things done? I don't right, understand. Right. Yeah, well, I see exactly what you're saying, though I will say we're, we're at a point where the Democrats do have three branches of government under their control. They're about to lose that, as you, you pointed out, but they did they did win a little bit. Um, <laughs> but I think, <laughs> I think you're absolutely right that um, Tracy, I, let, let me just put it this way, Tracy is a product of the meritocracy. She believes that if she works harder, if she is more competent and more qualified than anyone else, that she will deserve uh, the promotion and she will deserve the power that comes with it. Um, and she does believe that um, if there's an equal playing field, uh, the best person will win. Um, I think what, so Tracy came of age in the nineties uh, during the Clinton era and I don't think there were the critiques of meritocracy that, that we have now. We understand that it only worked for some people and, and not for others. I think Tracy um, thought of it the way that maybe Barack Obama thought of it, a way for people from the margins who don't have a lot of um, resources uh, can rise up within the society and, and get to positions that in the past had been um, you know, given to people who had uh, maybe more, uh, you know, families that had more money, they went to Ivy League institutions, it was more of a hereditary kind of power. And, and so for Tracy, she feels herself like an outsider who is competing to rise to the top. And what's happened, I think, during the course of her life um, is that there's been a populist reaction to the meritocracy. And the sense that the meritocracy has become a new kind of elitism. So people like Obama and the Clintons are very vilified uh, by Republican populists. They're, they are seen as elitists, even though they started out in you know, very humble circumstances compared to a Trump or a Bush, the people who have been you know, running the Republican Party in its various iterations. But so, yeah, in that sense, Tracy is, I think, uh, a good avatar for um, a certain kind of uh, elitist liberalism. I don't think she sees it as elitist, and I don't think a lot of Democrats in those positions see themselves as elitist, but I think the country has come to see them to some degree as elitist, or at least the right has come to see them that way, and the working class to some degree. It's really interesting be, when you're talking about the change in the way that people think about elitism and success or going to good schools, and which you know, I got out my my original copy of election uh, and went back to the to the book and and you know when that book that book is set as you said during the 1992 election came out in 1998 when I was reading it she seemed to me in certain ways like a kind of proto like the what the Republicans were kind of like back then right the Alex P Keaton I want to go to a great school I wear good clothes I'm organized I've got my shit together you know, kind of like the Republicans were like that and the Democrats were still thinking about the 60s, right? And now it's almost completely reversed. Like it's it's like Tracy Flick now belongs in the Democratic Party, whereas before she felt to me like she did, belonged in the Republican Party. I don't know if you felt that way, but that's how it seemed to me. You know, no, I think, I think that's a really uh, good observation. In this book, you know, when Tracy talks about being in law school, she identifies herself 
with the tough on crime Republicans, I think. She's basically saying, my way to rise within the political system will be, I'm gonna to go to law school, I'm gonna become a prosecutor. And she you know, kind of happily admits to being an opportunist. She said, one day the right case is gonna come my way and I'm gonna embody like the righteous vengeance of the state and people will hear my name you know, as this sort of crusading prosecutor, you know, like the kind of road that uh, Giuliani um, took, I think, you know, this idea, Tracy is a rule follower and her rule following goes to, yes, to process of things like elections, but also I think um, she is uh, in that sense, like an old school uh, disciplinarian. Like she believes that people should follow the rules, even though we've seen an election that she's capable of certain Machiavellian <laughs> dirty tricks. I mean, she's, uh, but you know, I, I, to that degree, you know, she has some contradictions like most people. You know, when, when you guys uh, mentioned some of these uh, questions when we talked earlier, um, I was starting to think of like, who is Tracy like? And, and the person who came to mind is a kind of Liz Cheney. You know, OK, that makes sense to me. You know what I mean? Like somebody who is a Republican at heart, but has been pushed uh, into the Democratic Party to some degree by um, what she sees as um, Trumpian uh, dishonesty and, and, you know, a Trumpian threat to democracy and, and the rule of, of law, which which is what she believes in, because um, I do think I think there's a version of Tracy that would be a more cynical Republican. I, I think she got knocked off this path, but I do think there's a version of Tracy that could have been like um, Elise Stefanik, say, um, who has become, who was a Harvard graduate, <laughs> uh, former never Trumper enemy of Trump, who's now become like Trump's, uh, you know, greatest advocate in, in the Republican house or one of them, because there's many of them. Maybe that's one of the things that makes that. I mean, she is a beloved character in American literature and like imagination. And maybe it is that sort of at least we know that she wouldn't become an Elise Stefanik, you know, that she has a certain kind of principles that she does stick to, even when they don't serve her. Like Giuliani, for instance, has given up all of his legal principles, is now giving press conferences outside landscaping offices, <laughs> telling people to ignore the election. I mean, he's completely changed. Yeah, no. And, and uh, you know, I think I. This was part of my issue in, in, or not issue, but but one of the problems I had to face, like where is Tracy politically? You know, this book was written during the Trump era and, and I really had to ponder that. And it did, I think I just had it in my heart, like Tracy is not a Trump follower. Tracy would have a visceral distaste, verging on disgust for Trump. The one thing that really bothers her is unearned male privilege. You know, in, in election, Mr. <laughs> M, the teacher goes out of his way, he finds this football hero who's not as smart as Tracy, he's the Herschel Walker of her high school, and, <laughs> and says, uh, you know, Paul is very popular, he's handsome, he's, you know, uh, you know, even though he's not the brightest guy in the world, he'll he'll get more. He's the uh, a threat to Tracy, and and it so infuriates her. She feels like I'm so much more qualified than this guy, and he's going to waltz in and take it from me. And I think you know, Trump is that uh, thing writ large. Of course, a much more malignant version of male privilege than uh, Paul Warren in election, but still another version of what Tracy sees as you know. A, an unqualified man getting an unfair advantage and taking from me the prize that um, I actually deserve. Um, so speaking of changing times and, and Tracy changing and, and us changing our understanding of her, um, the novel begins, Tracy Flick Can't Win begins with a, with a reevaluation of Tracy's relationship with Mr. Dexter, who's the high school yearbook supervisor who she slept with in election um, or rather kind of before the events of election. And, and she now has in this book, a different take on what transpired, like a more mature understanding. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how your own view of Tracy's agency and that relationship has changed as time has gone by. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would say that, that one of the reasons I wrote this book was 
because I was so aware during the Me Too moment of um, all the reevaluation going on in our culture around, um, you know, sexual relationships that involve power differentials and age differentials. So, um, you know, in the in the election, which was written in the early '90s, Tracy has a relationship with uh, with her teacher. It's very brief. Um, and she calls it off and the teacher gets exposed and, and fired. Um, but Tracy herself is very adamant that, you know, she wasn't a victim, that she had agency, that she's not traumatized. Um, she just basically says, this thing happened. You know, I wanted it to happen. Then it happened and I didn't like it. And I called it off and, you know, he got punished and let's just move on with my, um, progress toward a scholarship to college and, and a glorious career. She just basically um, says it was a thing that happened um, and now it's done and let's move on. Um, and of course, she's a 15 year old and, and, that, and he's a teacher. And, and um, I, I understand, you know, it, it was uncomfortable even then. Those kind of relationships were getting um, a certain kind of scrutiny back then, but I don't think the culture had like fully, I mean, a teacher with a 15 year old is always wrong, <laughs> but um, you know, I- and, No, you're and right. I, I mean, I think we've talked about this in terms of writing programs. There was a lot of, you know, relationships and affairs happening between students and teachers uh, in the in the nineties. It seemed was very common. Now high school is a different story, but still those things were happening. Yeah, and, and you know, Tracy was, plugged into a certain kind of girl power feminism, which basically said, um, you know, girls can do anything that that boys can do, that, um, you know, there's a certain kind of agency and power that you have to claim. And, and one thing I noticed was that like Madonna appears a number of times in election as a kind of a model for, a, um, you know, almost invulnerable femininity. Like, you know, there was just something about Madonna that is so different from like uh, pop stars today who are very, you know, I think maybe much more in touch with their vulnerability. And I think Tracy just saw like that kind of power as, as you know, literally as empowering for her. And now we pick up this book and it's 25 years later, she's an administrator. Um, the culture is, is going through this Me Too, uh, moment that is a kind of a revolution in thinking about um, sex and consent and rape culture and um, relationships that um, might have seemed consensual, but now look to us like, uh, like, like I think now we would just say, it doesn't matter if Tracy believes she consented, um, you know, and, and she herself understands that she would never tolerate this from a teacher that she's supervising as, as assistant principal. But but she's loath still to um, change the terms and accept the idea that she was a victim. She's still very um, wedded to the idea of, of her agency. But I think, I think one thing that's happened is um, that she's starting to realize that she wasn't as unique as she thought she was. She believed that this teacher saw in her a kind of maturity, and intelligence that set her apart from other high school kids. Um, and that that's what was going on in that relationship. And now I think she's heard enough Me Too stories and has looked into her own heart enough to understand like, oh, okay, that's what, that happened a lot to girls like me. Um, she didn't have a father in the house. She was looking for, um, you know, maybe validation from an adult man, you know, who, who knows what, what those issues are um, for Tracy. But I think um, she's been a little shaken by the fact that her life didn't go the way that she expected. And, and one of the things that she now has to look at is like, how did these experiences I had in high school, first with a teacher who slept with me and second with a teacher who tried to, you know, steal an election from me, um, how has that affected her life? And, and I think what she's starting to realize is that things that she saw as very personal, like this teacher saw me the way I wanted to be seen and this other teacher um, 
you know, really resented me and cheated. She's now starting to see like, oh no, it's actually um, a systemic thing. There was yeah. this, you know, there was a kind of a male predatory system in place that I fell on the wrong side of. And then there was also just a kind of um, fear of uh, these powerful young women who had basically entered the American scene en masse, you know, in, in that generation. Um, and and I feel like here, one of the things we see, I mean, we're talking about, um, right, the ways that male privilege affects particularly like young women. And one of the things we see Tracy realize here is also the ways in which, even though she's in this position of, you know, now she's a mature person, she has this um, school administrator job, and yet all of this is still affecting her. There's There's all of this sexism and there's all of this um what my what my former colleague charlie baxter refers to as like rhyming action so for if you're familiar with like the plot of election there are all of these echoes like like um there's a student lily chu who loses the student government election to a less deserving candidate um as tracy herself did and and there's all sorts of other kind of um little little rhymes in there and sort of little um references to like like tracy the first time she meets kyle dorfman the school board president um, who she thinks is, you know, maybe one of the people she needs to persuade um, her path to power. There's like a, a little reference to um, it being date-like, and you know, maybe Mike Pence is kind of right um, that there's no escaping this dynamic between between men and women. And I can't help but think, you know, we're talking about Me Too, um, and I also think of the recent overturning of Roe v. Wade, which was supposed to energize the electorate in favor of the Democrats, but now, according to polls that maybe isn't as important as gas prices. And so this all kind of leaves me asking, like how much have things really evolved in the decades between election and, and Tracy Flick can't win? Well, I will say, um, I, I know what you mean about echoes in the culture still. And I think Hillary Clinton was the ultimate, you know, Tracy yeah. in the sense, but but here's the thing, you know, um, I, th I think, one of the reasons we're still talking about Tracy Flick is that when I wrote this book, there weren't a lot of fictional representations of women politicians. And there weren't a lot of ex actual examples in the American political world. And I do think one of the big changes between then and now is that we can sit here and we can talk about an Elise Stefanik and we can talk about a Liz Cheney and we can talk about Nikki Haley and, and um, you know, AOC, I mean, we can, there are just a lot of examples now. And I do feel like in that sense, um, we have real world examples and we probably have more, um, way we definitely have more, you know, whether it's Veep in a satirical way um, or, um, you know, I'm trying to think, there must be, you know, TV shows that have powerful women characters. Um, so I, I do think in that sense, like we have a much broader spectrum of, examples, real world and, and um, you know, popular culture examples of, of powerful women. And in that sense, you know, we will have a woman president soon. It may not be one that liberals like, you know, I think that is quite possible. Um, sad to say. It's <laughs> um, all one in Great Britain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, we, the Margaret Thatcher did exist, uh, you know, back before I, I wrote um, uh, election, but um, and, you know, there was gold in my ear, but in the American, you know, Hillary Clinton was still a first lady and was being criticized for not wanting to bake cookies at, at, at that point. Um, but I will say, you talk about rhyming action, you know, the presence of a Herschel Walker or a Tommy Tuberville, this idea that, you know, um, especially in the, in the Deep South, that, that somebody's prowess on the football field really is all you need to know um, is, is enough for them to be elected to the Senate, even if they can't say a kind of a coherent thing about um, most of what, what the Senate does. And really what that is, is you know, a, a defense of that traditional hierarchy, which put a certain kind of alpha male at the top um, and, you know, relegated women to a, to a lesser place. And I think, I think basically when somebody votes for a Herschel Walker or a Tommy Tuberville, they're voting for, you know, the way it used to be. And that's Trump the same thing. Trump was the embodiment of the hierarchy that, um, you know, feminism and 
meritocracy where, and the civil rights movement, et cetera, all these, these um, forces, you know, we're, we're trying to dismantle that like he's a, you know, rich, white, uh, tall, you know, he, male, <laughs> you know, he, he just said like a, you know, he just, it, it would just people I think felt certain people of people of a certain generation and a certain disposition look at a guy like that and say, yeah, that's what a leader looks like. And they look at a Hillary Clinton or a Tracy Flick and they say, no, 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 that's not what a leader looks like. That's not what a leader sounds like. And I think um, that's part of what Tracy keeps running into. People look at her and they see an assistant principal, you know, not somebody who, who deserves real power um, in the world. Well, I mean, that seems to be, to me, uh, that's how I was reading the characters of Jack Weed and, and Vito Falcone is Jack Weed is the retiring principal that who's, who like was away for a while and then Tracy thought she was going to get his job. Then he came back and, and Vito Falcone is the ex-football player who's going around apologizing to everyone for the bad things that he's done in his life. And then this, there's also sort of the tech bro, Kyle Dorfman guy. Um, those are all different forms of sort of masculine rhetoric of conservative politics, you know, that's happening right now. And you said you were working on the book during the Trump administration. So I, I assume that that was something that you were exploring in those characters. Absolutely. Um, you know, and and I will say, and because it was, I say the Trump administration, but I also mean the Me Too moment. Um, so somebody like Vito is a version of Paul Warren from election. Um, Actually, I mean, that's what makes Herschel Walker so fascinating to me right now, because he's more like um, Vito Falcone. He's this guy who um, has been damaged by his decades of playing football and, and has a, you know, I mean, I mean, I think Herschel Walker, you know, may have some, you know, cognitive issues related to his, his football career. And that's the case for Vito. And, you know, Vito really fascinated me because I did think, um, even though you know Tracy keeps finding herself, you know, pushed aside by these uh, men, you know, I think the place of that sort of alpha male in the culture um, is subject to a lot more questioning and a lot more skepticism right now. Um, even though you know, obviously, this was during a time when a really damaged person like Trump was running the country. Um, but I do think, you know, the culture has started to view that sort of man with, with a lot more skepticism than before. And, and you know, some of the toxic um, parts of that kind of uh, male personality are, are definitely um, subject to scrutiny and we're, we're, we're aware of them. So I, 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 I like the idea of Vito being this sort of former alpha male who's now been knocked down a peg and he's, he's feeling vulnerable because his, you know, he senses that he's, you know, his memory's going on him. He gets lost when he goes out in the car. He thinks that he has, um, you know, a traumatic, the effects of a tra lingering effects from a traumatic brain injury. And, uh, you know, it, and and his life has fallen apart because he is, you know, he is a he 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 hit his wife, you know, and and she kicked him out, and he's had to admit that he's an alcoholic, and he's having to make amends, and and there's you know, he's hoping he's trying he's trying to to acknowledge his failures and and to to do better, and you know, in that sense, I think he's. He, he, he was sort of touching to me, you know, I do think um, men have a lot to answer for in this culture, um, but he's also just an individual man who um, has gone from feeling like he's on top of the world to feeling like he's hit bottom and um, he's trying to find a way back up and there is something, um, you know, moving to me about that. I was reading actually that I know that that he's kind of the character that you started the book with and that Tracy kind of then made herself known perhaps as just some sort of like natural, you know, got to return balance to the universe, I suppose, and can't have a veto without maybe also having a Tracy. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that, that, it's it's funny how that, that works. I do think that that was the case. I, I, I thought Vito was really a representative of um, 
you know, the male side of that Me Too moment, just of, of guys who were forced in some sense to account for their sins. You know, I, I do think there was something, you know, culturally cathartic about that. Um, but as a writer, you know, if I'm gonna write about a character, I really, um, you know, there's some element of judging them and some other element of just inhabiting them and trying to see what the world looks like from, from their eyes. And, and I do think I went from wanting to satirize Vito to immediately, you know, as soon as I started trying to imagine what it would be like, you know, to be in your forties and, and somebody who is so um, accustomed to being in charge and, and um, being desirable and, and being like strong and, and in his body that, that to start to be vulnerable, to, to really experience the world almost like an old person with dementia, um, that, that was, um, you know, I just, I, my, my heart went out to him. And then we were talking before about Kyle Dorfman, who I think holds particular fascination for me. And, and Whitney referred to him earlier as a tech bro. And we're interviewing you like kind of the, you know, this is t Twitter apocalypse of, of Elon Musk owning Twitter has now happened. We are in the after. And, um, you know, Kyle Dorfman is kind of an, an, a former nerd. Um, and, and I'm feeling and justified in never having applied for my blue check. <laughs> Fuck you, Elon Musk. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know, this morning I'm texting people like, do I stay on Twitter? What do I do? Um, but so, you know, and he wants to make the school that Tracy works at great again. Um, and I wonder if you would read us a passage featuring Kyle and Tracy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I think um, Kyle represents some other version of alpha maledom that is also, you know, kind of kind of changed since the days of election, right? That was you know, the early 90s was so innocent. I mean, we did not have the internet, <laughs> you know, and, and so those guys were still kind of relegated to the to the computer room. <laughs> but yeah, Kyle has made some money in, in tech and he's come back to his hometown, which he's very nostalgic about. And uh, he suggests to Tracy that what the school really needs is a hall of fame. And this is Tracy's reaction. We needed a lot of things at Green Meadow High School. A new roof, merit pay for outstanding instructors, better textbooks, smarter test prep, water fountains you can actually drink from, less meddling from the teachers union. The list went on and on. Did we need a hall of fame? Not really. Did I say that to Kyle? No, I did not. Why would I? I wasn't an idiot. I knew I'd need his support when I took over as principal and it made no sense to alienate him before I even had the job. In fact, I suspected that if I disagreed with him in our first face-to-face -face meeting, I might not even get the job. So yes, I let him talk. I nodded and looked interested and muttered a few harmless words of encouragement. In my defense, it wasn't a completely crazy idea. Lots of schools have a hall of fame. Usually the people who get honored are athletes, which only reinforces the existing, very unfair social hierarchy and excludes a lot of exceptional people who are far more deserving of recognition. I actually liked that part of Kyle's pitch. He said he wanted to focus on a broad spectrum of excellence, celebrating our former students not just for their athletic prowess, but for their intellectual and artistic achievements, their business acumen, their community service, even their parenting skills. We could totally honor someone for being an outstanding stay-at-home mom, he told me, though he didn't articulate the criteria for selecting one stay-at-home mom over another. I have no problem with that. Some of his proposals were a little over the top. The bronze plaques he wanted to affix to the lockers that had belonged to our famous alums, the brass stars he hoped to embed in the sidewalk leading up to the main entrance, the Green Meadow Walk of Fame, the glass display cases he planned to install throughout the school containing artifacts belonging to our honorees, clothing they'd worn, musical instruments they'd played, objects they'd invented, whatever. Like if someone was an astronaut, he said, maybe we could exhibit their spacesuit and helmet. Not that anyone from Green Meadow had ever gone into space. 
one of our graduates, Raymond Valdez, had made it into the training program, but he had some issues with claustrophobia that ultimately disqualified him. He still works for NASA, but in a more mundane capacity, probably not the kind of job that would get you inducted into a hall of fame. The point is, I was hearing all this for the first time and doing my best to keep an open mind. It was like a brainstorming session, like he was throwing a bunch of crap at the wall to see what would stick. I figured we'd scale back to a reasonable level as we move forward, if we move forward, because that's what usually happens. You ask for the world and settle for scraps. What do you think, he asked. Give me your honest opinion. That's the thing about a can of worms. It doesn't always come with a label on it. Kyle, I said, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so you said earlier that you thought that Tracy had been bumped off of the possible more negative path into what she is today, right? A, a, a school administrator. But let's imagine that she became a political consultant instead, which I think is totally within the realm of possibility for her. Um, I would like you, through you, speaking for her to uh, her take on some of the current elections. For instance, we talked about Arizona. There's a crucial governor's race there. We talked about at the top of the show pitting Republican Carrie Lake, a former TV news anchor against Democrat Katie Hobbs, who's currently sec Secretary of State. And this seems like really interesting that involves some of the issues that we've been talking about. So far, Hobbs like has refused to debate Lake, and she's running a, a sort of straight sort of you know, campaign as an effective, honest government official gets things done. And yet Lake is like an election denier who's telegenic and everybody, you know, and charismatic and good on TV. And Lake is winning, which I think would frustrate uh, Tracy, probably. Um, what advice would Tracy give to Katie Hobbs, who seems clearly better qualified for that office, but not nearly as exciting as Carrie Lake? Yeah, well, I mean, it's funny. It's, it's hard for me to see Tracy as an election advisor. Instead, I would say to you that I think that she is personally a Hobbes, you know, and, and I think the election deniers would really um, cause her a lot of uh, agitation because of course she was uh, the victim of somebody who actually did try to steal an election. I guess that you, know, you could say, well, that might make her more sympathetic to the idea that elections could get stolen. But I would say that that uh, Tracy is a Hobbes who wishes that she could be a Lake. Um, I think she could <laughs> look, look at somebody like Lake and realize like, oh, that's how you play the game now. Um, but I don't think she has the stomach for it personally. Um, I don't know what, I, I think, I imagine that she would say to Hobbes, um, you ultimately have to fight this person. You have to, yes. you, you, you can't hide behind process, even though, even if you were, you know, you have to defend the process, you can't just say, um, I mean, it's, it's turned out to have been, I think, a, a very bad move for Hobbes. I think she thought she could marginalize Lake and that doesn't seem to be what happened. And I do think Tracy, um, at her best is is a fighter. And I think she would maybe advise Hobbes to, or maybe would have advised her previously to fight harder and, and to stand up for what it is she believes. Um, I feel rather, like she definitely would have debated at least, right? Yeah, no, I, I don't, I can't imagine Tracy um, uh, hiding from a debate. And what advice do you think that she would give to the Democrats generally? Is it kind of kind of more of that? And and are there candidates that she would have stood behind in particular? I, you know, I I think a lot of people are following Fetterman versus Oz with particular interest. Um, and you've mentioned Herschel Walker a couple of times, who I admit I'm I'm also fascinated by. Well, what are her takes on these or imaginary takes on these races? Yeah, you know, it, it's it's an interesting one because again, I think. Um, Tracy is a kind of a Liz Cheney figure where she does um, maybe fall a little bit between between the parties. You know, I, I do think she would have been um, a, a person who who believed in in law and order, um, and that would have pushed her maybe into a more conservative place. And and uh, um, you know, I think I think that she would have. There are a few Democrats. There are these uh, like um, uh, 
the, the woman that Liz Cheney just um, uh, endorsed, uh, Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan. Um, there, there are these, uh, you know, Democratic candidates who are veterans. Uh, you know, uh, they're bringing a kind of um, centrist, uh, institutional kind of um, uh, quality to the party. I don't think she would be sympathetic with the uh, AOC, Bernie Sanders, very left wing, um, you know, kind of a version of democratic populism. I, I do think she is um, an institutionalist and a, a little bit more of an elitist than she realizes. And, and she would not like Fetterman's hoodies, I don't think. I don't think she would. I don't think he looks like a leader <laughs> to, to her. Um, and he does all of his interviews with that, like in his basement with that, like, weird stone <laughs> brick wall behind him. I'm always like, and I know that's for, that's for a fact, I think, but I don't think she would like that effect. No, I, I'm, I mean, I'm interested that you said she wouldn't like AOC because I was kind of wondering if like AOC would be like, I don't know, Tracy, like successful Tracy Flick, who is so likable and has, um, you know, created such a movement behind him. And I'm also just kind of like, what, what does Tracy Flick think of Joe Biden, who is also like, you know, he's a manifestation of male privilege and also like a centrist in a way that she might admire. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think I think Jack Weed, if if you know her principle is a kind of uh, Joe Biden figure, it's just I think she would just say, you know, um, his time has come and gone. I, I think I agree with you. I think I think Tracy should look at an AOC and say that that's kind of an improvement on me. Like like AOC um, is clearly smart in a kind of a Tracy Flick way, but I think she has um, a much a much looser and more fun um, vibe. You know, I remember, I think of that video of her dancing on the roof in college. Like you just cannot imagine Tracy Flick, you know, dancing on, <laughs> on the roof in college. And yet I think it's funny because the conservatives tried to play that video as like, oh, look at this lightweight AOC. But for me, it was just like, oh, that just made her so much more, you know, human and you know she worked as a bartender like she she does seem to have this kind of um populist touch that tracy really lacked and that hillary really lacked like i do think there was something about you know the feminism of 20 or 30 years ago that that you know is that thing of like you have to work twice as hard and everybody's looking at you and you can never um get off message and you can never wear so something you know i mean i don't like kirsten cinema's politics at all but like the fact that she's wearing these kind of wild clothes in in uh on the senate floor you know and and is bisexual it's like she just seems to come out of some whole other place than somebody like Tracy or Hillary who had consultants you know Hillary would have consultants they like wear this you know this is how you should look and these are you know everything was sort of professional and tested and I do think um there are are limits to the effects of I'm, I'm glad to see that sort of um you know part of politics fading away toward you know images that I think are are um well I mean I mean that sometimes it can be terrible it can be like it's allowed a lot of celebrities to get unearned political power but I do think this that era of you know the professional politician um is a little bit fading out and and I think well, Tracy <laughs> would have been a professional politician if she'd ever gone that route while we we're while you're saying that, I thought of and and it's sad that I've forgotten this person's name already. But who is the a uh, politician from Minnesota who ran in the primaries? Oh, Amy um, Klobuchar. Yeah, that's who I think of when I think of Tracy as being a politician like that. That's an interesting. Uh, I, I hadn't thought about that, but now that you mention it, um, I think there's something to be said there, even to the point of, um, you know. I, I she was supposed to be mean to her assistant sometimes, I could imagine. Well, I think I, there, there were definitely stories about that, but I think also there was some interesting thing where she had sort of come from, I think she talks a lot about um, like being the child of an alcoholic and, and you know, kind yeah. of working her way up from, from a small town. And, and um, so I, I, I do think, I do think she represents like that generation of politicians. She is a kind of a, a model for Tracy Flick. And that's why maybe Liz Cheney wasn't a good example because Liz Cheney, her career was so clearly boosted by the fact that her father was this, you know, 
the vice president of the United States, one of the most powerful Republicans. So in that sense, she wasn't Tracy-like, but I think Amy Klobuchar is actually um, a, a really good uh, model for a, a sort of Tracy-like politician. And um, yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's a good call. I was actually thinking of Katie Porter and her like portable whiteboard and her dry erase marker and her um, her righteous lectures, which honestly I I totally enjoy, um, and which I think come off like it's, they don't come off with that kind of grating self righteousness that um, I think rubs some people the wrong way, and they just come off as very very winsome um, and with the sort of lawyerly expertise and knowledge that that is so admirable. So maybe that's I don't know that's sort of generationally maybe in between um AOC and, and Amy Klobuchar but that's yeah I mean Amy Klobuchar is um yeah in Minnesota like kind of in yeah an, an interesting figure I mean there was also a moment when her hot dish recipe was circulating on the internet and what felt to me like a very calculating move and I also went and looked at the hot dish recipe and I was like that seems actually like it might be tasty <laughs> <laughs> and she had never really I don't know she wasn't a politician who kind of like had my heart and then I was like why doesn't she what's wrong what's wrong with how I'm looking at her yeah, well, it's funny. I think, oh, pardon me. I'm actually having a little cramp in my leg. I'm just going to pause for a second. Sure. That's all right. We're 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 about to sign off here at moments, but we'll we'll let you uncramp. That's so strange. I guess I was just sitting and unmovingly. <laughs> um, should I count actually, back in? Yeah. We can actually, yeah, go ahead. Just, to, uh, just give a short answer to that, and then we'll sign off because we're okay. right at time. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I was just going to respond to your Katie Porter comment, which I think, I think that she was able to have a little bit of, of fun, and there's a little bit of irony in that kind of self-knowledge. And I, I do think um, sometimes for, for somebody like Tracy, um, there's a lack of, of a sense of fun, you know, that, that I think... Um, actually really helps a lot in, in politics. And, and again, I think it just had to do with her sense that she had to do battle to make her way in the world, that she was, she's a warrior and, and uh, a, a warrior of the meritocracy, you know, and I think that's an exhausting pose, you know, and I think she's feeling the, uh, the weight of that lifetime of, of, you know, fighting her way through a system that, um, doesn't really want to recognize her achievements. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, listeners, make sure you uh, get out there and pick up a copy of Tracy Flick Can't Win. It's out now. And I uh, hope we talk to you again soon. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us.